Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar series with MemoQ. I'm Aurélie from the IGDL LogSig, and I will be the co-host for today. And I will let my other co-host, Julia, introduce herself and our guest and explain to you how it will happen. Julia, it's up to you. Hi, everybody. So lovely to see you here uh, tonight or uh, noon or whenever the time is for you right now. Uh, we're so excited to have you here for our first uh, webinar with MemoQ, our now official partners. Uh, and we're so excited to uh, have Santiago de Miguel here and also uh, Damien Sabi. And I want to throw the ball quickly to Damien before Santiago can take the floor for the whole webinar. Because he's going to be the one uh, hosting this awesome presentation today for you. At the end, we're also going to have a uh, Q&A session where you can ask questions directly. So feel free to just type your uh, questions in the chat. I'm going to be uh, picking them up later. Uh, Aurelie, me and Damien will disappear for the whole duration of the webinar. So. Just you know, type your questions whenever, or save them for the last Q and A uh, minutes. And uh, yeah, we're gonna see each other then again. And now I'm going to throw the ball quickly to Damien before we can jump right into the webinar. Thank you so much, Julia and Aurélie. Um, hi everyone, and um, well, welcome to to this webinar. Um, so I, I work in product marketing at MemoQ and. Uh, I'm um, the person behind the organization of this webinar together with Julia and Aurélie. Um, so thank you for being here with us today. And um, I would like to pass the mic to Santiago, who will start today's session. Awesome. Thank you so much, Damien. And thank you, Aurélie. Thank you, Julia and IGDA in general for inviting me. And of course, MemoQ as well uh, for supporting me. And well, I'm Santiago de Miguel, I'm based in Argentina, I'm a video game translator and I'm also a gaming solution engineer here at MemoQ, which means that I'm usually in charge of webinars, training, consultations and all those things, you know, in general, just helping clients make the most uh, of the tool. Um, okay, you can see my guitar back there, don't worry, I'm not singing, I'm not playing today. Uh, I'm just going to talk about video games. So, uh, let me start sharing my screen. Give me a minute. Boom, you should be able to see my presentation. Can someone confirm that, please? Okay. I suppose that's a yes, right? Okay, good. Um, so let's get started. First of all, what to expect from this webinar? Um, since this is organized by the IGDA, I'm mostly going to focus on some of the localization best practices for gaming companies. Okay, developers in general. Um, but I know that many colleagues will be here in the audience as well. So hopefully there will be something for everyone. Okay. Um, again, since this is our first webinar series together, uh, I'm going to talk about some very basic um, best practices. Okay. Some may even seem too basic for some of you. I'm sure about that. But again, I don't want to uh, believe that everyone knows how to get started with localization. And based on my experience at MemoQ, I can see that some companies have great localization pipelines and workflows, while some others don't. Okay, so that's the people I'm mostly talking to uh, today. Please, as uh, the girl said, you can ask as many questions as you want in the chat and I'll try to answer them at the end of the webinar or in written form if we run out of time or maybe I don't even know the answer for you. Good. Um, so I'm mostly going to focus on four pillars that I think are
essential for some people, but for others, don't. So my first question for you out there is how long does it take to develop a game? Okay, if you're a developer, you're creating your own game, how long does it take? Um, I don't have the answer for this. You will know better than myself, but let's take just a AAA game as an example. It can take, I don't know, like eight, seven, more than five years at least. And smaller games, of course, will take a shorter amount of time, but they still take a couple of years. So, um, how much time do you spend on localization if you're already localizing your games? Or how much time do you think localization will take? Again, I cannot give you a precise answer for this, but believe me, it will take quite a long time. Much longer than you expect, probably. So, my first simple suggestion is just don't rush it, okay? Localization will take time. It's a creative process, okay? It's not just taking words in a language and spitting out words in a different language. It's a much more uh, complex uh, process than that. It's creative, it's a craft, but it's also technical, okay? So you shouldn't forget about that. Um, I'm sure that the words machine translation were thrown to you at one point, but at least in my experience, MT is still not great for gaming, mainly because of that, because it's creative, because each game is different, okay? New worlds are just created. So let's take uh, some time to localize the game uh, correctly, okay? However, I'm sure that we've all heard of crunch. We know that schedules are usually tight. So you might be wondering, okay, I don't have the time. I wish I had enough time, but maybe I'm in a localization department of a gaming company and I don't have the time. Okay, well, then you can consider splitting the tasks. Of course, it's usually best to just work with one linguist for translation and then another linguist for review, for example. But I know that that's not always possible, okay? So you can split the task. But if you're going to do that, you will definitely need a reviewer, okay? Someone needs to make sure that everything is coherent, okay? Style, terminology, all that needs to be reviewed but one person. I mean, you always need a reviewer, but again, from experience, I know that's, that that's not always the case. But especially if you're going to split the task between many people, you will need someone, okay, to review uh, the work. Then you can also rely on automation. Again, being at MemoQ, I can see how much gaming companies value automation and they are always trying to automate more and more. So try to look for ways to automate your processes so that you can save some time and then spend some more time on the translation itself, okay? Um, so you should definitely look for content management systems, translation management systems, uh, business management systems. There are lots and lots of ways of automating things, okay? Um, also, you should consider that localization is not just translation, okay? Many companies, many people believe that just out of ignorance, and that's perfectly okay. We're here to educate each other. However, when you're planning on localizing your game, you should take into account that it will require some pre-processing, okay? Uh, like extracting the strings from your game engine or whatever engine you're developing your game in. Then that will need to be translated. That will al almost usually be edited. Then sometimes that is proofread, meaning that only the target language is being reviewed while in editing the source is compared to the target. Then you will need to go through an LQA round that's basically playing the game, having testers play the game and identify uh, issues with the translation like truncation, overflow, and just strings that were translated out of context uh, incorrectly. And finally, you need to take all that and put it back into your engine or whatever system you're using to develop your game, okay? Um, so, you were suddenly originally thinking of maybe just translating your game on an Excel sheet, and suddenly you're thinking of 
doing a lot of extra steps that you weren't really considering before. So you should plan ahead. Okay. Um, there's a really, really good article at IGDA's blog, uh, which is really good on how to plan your localization timeline. Okay. So if you haven't read it, you should definitely check it out because it can be complex. Good. So this is time planning. Okay. Now I'd like to focus on consistency, which is also another key element when it comes to localization. Okay. You need to be consistent. Okay, this sounds very vague and I will be uh, explaining things further now. So, consistent with what? You might be wondering. Okay, this can be applied to many, many things, but let me explain what I mean as a linguist and as a kind of localization engineer, okay? File name, file format, file structure, and tags and placeholders, okay? We will then see why, in, in specific detail, why I want you to be consistent with this. Um, I know that sometimes this is just not your responsibility, you work with what you get, but I'm sure that you, if you're working with a developer or you're the developer yourself, you have some degree of control, okay? Um, if you're working in a huge company, a AAA game developer, then it's much harder to to influence each uh, other people's you know um, opinion on this but in smaller companies this is much easier at least in my experience that's what i see okay so file name uh try to be consistent try to find a pattern that you will always follow when it comes to uh, file names here i'm just giving you an example maybe you could go for the game title underscore the content type underscore and the batch number if you're working with files okay because maybe you're just not working with files you're using a repository you're using a content management system but again what i see working at memoq and also as a translator with some smaller developers is that many people still use files excel files json files xml's doesn't matter but they still use files okay so that would be a nice structure to follow, okay? Um, there you have an example using Overwatch, okay? This is just a random example. I like that game. I used to play it a lot, not that much now, but back then it was a huge fun. So you can see, okay? A, a very simple example. Then file format. Again, are you working with Excel files? Stick to that. Are you using JSONs? Stick to that. Of course, different um, content types may require different file types, but just try to stick to a couple, okay? Because then you're going to make life much easier for the engineers or the project managers that will be working and handling your game, okay? Uh, so the more consistent you are, the more time you will save in the future and that means the more time you will be dedicating to the translation and localization parts of the job, okay? File structure. Again, you're now being consistent with the format. It's good to always follow the same structure, okay? So are you going to have your string IDs in column A, the source in column B, and then the different languages in different columns try to stick to that structure? Okay, and if your file has different, uh, sorry, um, a big number of sheets, try to keep that structure as well within all those sheets. Okay, and then if you're going to have your own tags and placeholders, which is very typical, you know, in, in gaming and in software in general, again, try to be consistent, uh, try to always follow the same structure because that will help, again, the engineers or the project managers protect them from uh, errors, basically. So again, you have some examples here of consistent tags, um, consistent placeholders, and what's very nice as well is that you can include some context information within the tags and within the placeholders. So instead of using random numbers and um, numbers and letters, you could include valuable information and we the linguists will really really appreciate it let me see if i can use the pointer ah here we go good so here you have 
examples of some more meaningful tags and placeholders, okay? Then, please use string keys, okay? I worked with some developers that don't include string keys at all, and it makes the work much, much harder, believe me. Maybe this is not so important to you, but it's very relevant to the linguist that may not have a lot of context. Again, if we're talking about AAA companies with great processes, they usually provide you with a lock kit and a lot of context information, but that's not always the case, okay? So let's try to make the most of what we have available at hand and create some unique, clear, and meaningful string keys or string IDs, whatever you want to call them. So here you have some examples of meaningful string keys attack underscore btn this will tell me that this is a button not a title okay or not just an attribute a stat okay and same with titles depending on the languages titles are translated differently than just descriptions and the same thing happens with buttons actions or just attributes okay um also if you have string keys even if they are not really meaningful that will help you leverage past translations, okay? So this will result in a more consistent translation, and this will also imply savings on your end, sometimes, depending on how you work, okay? Um, so you will be leveraging existing translations with more accuracy, because again, you can have the same source with different translations. I'm going to give you this example a lot, a lot of times. The term attack. I always run into this issue when translating into Spanish. Is this a verb or is this a noun? Okay, that question will be there all the time. So, if you have string keys, the verb will be separate from the, the, um, the noun, okay? And this will help the linguists and then you will be saving time because no questions will be asked. File updates, okay? We know uh, with continuous uh, localization, mobile games, Online games, they get updated every single day sometimes, or maybe once, um, more than once every day. So whenever you need to update your files, then the string keys will be very useful because the software that you will be using, hopefully, uh, will know where to take the translations from, okay? Again, even if the same source uh, is repeated all over the file, the translations may be different. And as I was saying, context information is provided through the string keys. So please, please try to make an effort and include some really good and meaningful uh, string keys or IDs. Terminology. This is another key element when it comes to localization. Okay. So this is very important. I know that you spend a lot of time coming up with cool terms for your game to make it engaging, to make it interesting, to make it unique. So the translators will have to do the same, okay? Um, building a comprehensive and consistent glossary is essential for a good linguist, at least, okay? Um, especially if you're splitting the tasks between many people, they will need a good glossary, okay? So spend some time building it, please. A good glossary is usually a synonym of a good translation, good quality, okay? At least when it comes to terms. Um, however, I usually run into this issue when working with developers, both at MemoQ and as a translator. Um, there's no clear agreement on when to start building the glossary, okay? Some people like to start doing it before the project, the, the translation itself starts. Some other people like to do this during the project, okay, on the go. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'll just give you a couple of suggestions for both use cases, okay? Good. So, if you're planning on building your glossary before the main translation task is launched, then make sure you, that you give your linguists enough context to actually translate the terms correctly, okay? Otherwise, this can and will backfire, actually. Um, I can tell you how many times I've been in this situation translating just a list of terms that seem very random to me because I don't even know the game. Maybe the game is not released yet, or if it's released, I don't have it. 
okay? That's another nice way of filling these gaps that we have, you know, uh, when translating. Um, and the problem is that it's usually a rush thing, okay? Rush task, you need to do it quickly. You don't have all the context information. Um, the linguists will bombard you with questions because they need the context to translate correctly. And even so, the translations may not be as good as expected, okay? Because we don't have the whole picture. Um, so keep that in mind. Try to include as much context as possible. Maybe even have a call. And also considering a nicer rate for this, if you're pre-translating, let's say, the glossary, because it's not the same to translate a glossary than to translate a dialogue, okay? That, the, the latter happens much, much faster. If you have in-house linguists, maybe it's a good idea for them to build the glossary instead of using a freelancer that don't really know, doesn't really know the game, okay? An in-house translator will have direct contact with other people that are more involved in the game itself, like developers, uh, writers, or just project managers that know the game because they've been involved in the creation. Um, so that could be a good alternative. And then, of course, you can use the glossary um, with the linguists, with the freelance linguists, if you're using them, or an agency if you're working with an agency. Um, I was going to say something else. Yeah, and also, you should consider then that the, uh, a good glossary, in my opinion at least, should be alive, okay? Uh, maybe realize that the best translation wasn't the first one, so I think it's good to be open to changes on the go, okay? Of course, that will probably require some editing on existing translations or older translations, but I've done that, okay? We all make mistakes as well, so um, if you have things neatly organized, it can be very easy to just change the translation of a term on the go, okay? Now, if you're going to build your glossary on the go during the translation task itself, make sure that the linguists have access to the updated glossary. <laughs> Otherwise, it's useless. I know this may be very obvious to some of you, but I know companies, again, that maybe share their glossaries with linguists on an offline Excel sheet. So then they update it and there's a gap between the time you know they update it and the time they send it. So the, translator, the translators will just keep using an old version of the glossary and then they need to update the whole thing. It takes time. Usually you don't get paid for that and it's not really nice, okay? So try to avoid that. If you're not using any specialized tool, there are many, uh, at least go for an online uh, Google Sheet or something, okay? Um, something that will be updated in real time and that everyone can access and check whenever they need uh, to find uh, a translation, okay? And again, try to use a reviewer uh, as usual to make sure that the translations are consistent and appropriate and correct, yeah? Uh, again, usually using a reviewer is your best option for every single localization um, project. I know it's more expensive, it will take more time, but believe me, it's worth it. It improves the quality a lot. Um, also, I think this is very important. Again, based on my experience, mainly working with agencies where many, many linguists have the possibility to add and edit terms. You need to be consistent with your term formatting. Otherwise, this will create some issues, okay? So, first of all, just add meaningful terms to the glossary. Don't add any single term like hello, welcome. I've seen that, and that will end up causing more issues than helping linguists, okay? Avoid plurals, avoid conjugations. Go for the root of the words, okay? Simple terms. Uh, so, don't use plurals. If you're going to add a verb to the glossary, just go for the infinitive, okay? In English, without the two, of course. Just the main root of the verb. Um, otherwise, 
the the tool that you're using, if you're using any tool, won't recognize the term itself because it's written in plural or because it's a gerund, okay? And then if the verb comes up in infinitive form or a different conjugation, the term won't recognize it. And it may even be harder for linguists to find those terms within a simple Google Sheet, okay? Because they are spelled differently. Avoid uppercase as well, unless the term should be in uppercase, okay? That's a different story. So, if you're writing a term in English, just use the uppercase if the actual term is capitalized. And same thing in your target languages. In Spanish, I translate into Spanish, let's just use uppercase for those proper nouns or, I don't know, names of places that should actually be capitalized. Otherwise, it's very confusing for the linguist, then the linguist will have to search for uh, other instances of the translation to see whether the uppercase is actually part of the term itself or not, and everyone will just waste time, and this will also create inconsistencies, okay? So just avoid uppercases. Finally, if you do all this, and you're using a TMS, a translation management system, or any QA tool, actually, like Xpench, you will actually be avoiding false positives. Uh, again, real world experience. I'm tired of having a client of mine send me huge reports, quality assurance reports, filled with false positives when it comes to terminology because the linguists don't follow any kind of rule when it comes to adding terms. And it's not entirely their fault because they didn't receive any guidelines on how to add terms, but you should take this into account, okay? Uh, you will be saving time, basically, and money. Finally, the fourth pillar for this talk has to do with, actually, communication, okay? Stakeholders, the people involved in the project need to communicate effectively, okay? Talking to each other will make things easier, will make things faster, and will make things better. So, Keep in mind that good linguists will ask questions, okay? And they don't do that because they're just annoying. They do that because they care about the quality. As I said, this is a craft. I can tell you that we translators love to translate your game and we put a lot of effort in your game. We want it to be good, okay? The best work possible. So, we will have questions. Um, please try to answer them in time, not an hour before delivery and also if you're a linguist watching this do your own research right before asking the question uh have a look at all the context that you have have a look at the context uh the string key or string id google ask your friends ask your colleagues try to find the answer before uh going uh through the easy path which is actually asking the question i've been there i've done this but I'm trying to avoid it, okay? And let's all try to avoid it because everyone is busy, you know? And usually schedules are tight. So again, the more time we save, the better for everyone. So communication between the linguists and the PMs or project owners is essential. You can use a chat application or email just for everyday communication or let's say more casual questions but it's a good idea to use some kind of query sheet or system for uh, questions that have to do with terminology, understanding a specific string, okay? Things that should be documented and that can help everyone in the project, not just a person asking the question, okay? Um, this is just a very simple example of what a query sheet can look like. This is just a real sheet that I use with a client of mine. It's just an Excel sheet or a Google Sheet, doesn't matter. Oh, of course, it's better if it's shared among everyone. But you can see the different columns that you can have. Um, it's usually important to include the string key or string ID um, and a clear question, please, okay? And of course, the source. Uh, it's good to include the key or the ID for the PM or the project owner to easily find the string or ask a developer about it. Uh, because as I said, the string keys are unique, so you cannot go wrong. If you have to ask a question about the term attack, you should provide the, the key because it can differ depending on where that word appears, okay? 
And also communication between linguists can be very beneficial. And this is something I don't see all the time. Again, maybe those companies were more established or more developed localization pipeline, they do this, but some others seem to be very secretive about the translators and very restrictive when it comes to communication. And it should be the other way around, okay? Where people, we need to communicate, we need to discuss options. Um, so having a clear communication channel for translators and reviewers, believe me, it will be beneficial. It will re result in better quality and it will also uh, reduce friction because we're human, uh, we love our job, we love our options, and sometimes when we get reviewed, I know that we don't like it, okay? Um, so it's just easier to talk to each other. Uh, sometimes friction doesn't happen. That's the best way to, to do things because it's, this is just your job, your work. But some people take it personally or some reviewers maybe don't have the best way of communicating uh, corrections. So talking is just a great way to avoid this. Again, you could use a chat application. I use some clients. I work with some clients that use Slack, some others just use Skype, Teams, whatever, uh, or just the good old email, okay? Good, so those were the very four, the, the very essential four um, best practices or best pillars of best practices that I wanted to talk about. And now I want to focus a little bit on how we can use MemoQ to actually achieve all this, okay? Um, but first, what's MemoQ, okay? Because I know that maybe there are people here who don't know what this is, uh, developers or even linguists that haven't heard of MemoQ. So, in a nutshell, MemoQ is a translation management system. Some linguists will know this as a CAT tool, computer-assisted translation tool, but it's actually more than that because a CAT tool is just for translating. Well, MemoQ will help you manage the project. Okay, projects actually in plural form. So you create projects in MemoQ, you can connect it to your own systems, content management systems, to your Git uh, repository. Then you transfer information from one system to MemoQ, and then you can assign the different tasks or files to different linguists and the different roles as well. In that project, you will add some resources like translation memories which is like the brain of the tool it's a huge database of translations basically that will store the translations the string ids or string keys and then it will leverage them to uh basically try to reuse any existing translations when they come up again okay either completely or partially that's MemoQ in a nutshell. So let me briefly show you how MemoQ can help you with time management, okay? So I talked about workflows. In MemoQ, you have a three-step workflow, translation, review one, review two, okay? The steps are optional, except for translation. Of course, if you're going to translate your game, you need at least that step. And you can assign different people and different deadlines for each of the files that you're working on, okay? Good. We also talked briefly about what to do if you're in a tight schedule, okay? You can split the tasks, as I said before, using this feature called slicing. This is a PM-only feature, so if there are any linguists here that have a, um, a Translator Pro license, you won't find this. But it's a very, very useful feature, okay? For, for PMs, I see clients use this all the time. And basically you can divide one single file into several tasks and then assign those tasks to different people, okay? So what some people like to do is have reviewers and translators change roles, okay? So they can review each other and learn from each other's uh, translations as well. That's very, very nice. Also in MemoQ, you have different assignment options based on your needs. Again, the most typical assignment is just picking one person for the role, assigning a deadline, and that's it. But as you can see in this screenshot, you also have the possibility to assign a task to a sub-vendor, okay? Meaning you're a developer, you work with an LSP or an agency, you can assign um, maybe even just one file within a whole project to 
this LSP and they will take care of assigning that to the linguists. Okay, they will manage everything and you will receive your translations back. And then there are two more assignment options called group sourcing and first accept. I'm not a huge fan of these as a linguist, uh, but I know that sometimes companies need to do this. So group sourcing, this is not widely used. This is usually just used by uh, companies that have an in-house team of translators and they need to get things done very quickly. Or maybe they don't even want to assign things themselves. They want the linguists to arrange uh, the, the, the distribution of files themselves. So this means that whatever people you assign to a file, they will all be able to work on it. Okay, so you need to be a little bit careful. Don't use this all the time, but it could be useful. Okay, and then we have first accept, which I'm sure you already know what it does. Uh, you can assign a group of people to a file, then a notification will be sent to them, and the first person who accepts the job will actually get to keep it and work on it. Okay, again, this is not something I usually recommend because it's better to have one same person working on your game or at least the same group of people working on your game. Uh, but sometimes time is of the essence and you need to do this. Okay, good. Then to save a little bit of time, you can automate things within MemoQ using templates. Okay, um, templates in MemoQ work a little bit different than they do in other tools because here, not only you will have a pretty fine set of, um, let's say, rules, uh, settings, whatever, you will al also have automated actions in place. Uh, so we will have a list of triggers and you will have a list of actions that will actually be triggered when those conditions are met. So you can see here a very simple example, but I'm telling MemoQ that whenever a document is imported, it should be pre-translated. There should be an analysis report created to have a very precise word count. And then the document should be automatically assigned to the users working on the project. Okay. Um, you also can automate the filter selection. Uh, we will have a little bit of a chat about filters in a minute and you can also have automatic resource selection okay or creation uh, for the project translation memories glossaries qa profiles machine translation engines and more can be predefined using a template okay good consistency we talked a lot about this it's very important so within memoq you can create filters and save them. Let me briefly explain you what a filter is. Um, this could be useful for both gaming companies and also linguists, okay? Because many people don't know that you actually need to create your own filters before getting the files into MemoQ so that then the linguists can translate only the translatable content, content, sorry. And that's the whole thing, okay? When you have a file, let's say uh, an Excel file, not everything should be translated, okay? Maybe you need to translate only column B and everything else should be either context, either uh, string ID, comments, character limitations, or just other languages, okay? So as you can see here, when you create a filter for Excel, you define the different columns to different meanings, okay? So you need to do this, you need to take your time. Maybe your Excel file will have uh, several sheets, so you need to uh, set them up as well. And finally, you can save the filter and reuse it later, okay? So you are being consistent with your file imports, but also you're saving time. Um, in your filters, you can tell MemoQ what is a comment as well for context information, which please try to, to provide, and also character limitations, which again, for some games, most games <laughs> are very, very necessary, okay? Especially if you are developing mobile games, try to include at least some estimated character limitations so that linguists can know uh, how much they can <laughs> include, basically, in their translations. Um, good. 
Once you have your filters created, you can select them based on the file name if you're using a template. Yeah, remember I talked about being consistent with the file name and the structure? Okay, the structure has to do with the filter creation. Yeah, if you always use the same structure, you always use the same filter. You create it once and that's all. And if you follow the same naming convention, then you can select the same filter or the appropriate filter based on the name. Okay, so if you have several content types, maybe you can include a keyword in the name for MemoQ to identify that that is, let's say, UI, and then pick the right filter for UI. Maybe then you have another file for uh, narrations, okay, narrative content, and you have a different filter for that. Okay, try to include a keyword in the name so that MemoQ can use that filter. Yeah, this is super, super useful, and it will save you quite a lot of some precious time. String keys and string IDs. I know you must be bored about this term already, but believe me, it's very useful. When you create a translation memory within MemoQ, remember this huge database of translations, you can tell the tool whether you want it to store the string keys or not. You want that, of course. And you also have the choice to store what we call double context, which means that MemoQ will store the translation itself, the string ID or string key, and also the text flow, so the order of the strings. If that's not uh, relevant for your project, which in gaming is not usually that relevant, you can just go with simple context and this will just make the translation memory smaller and quicker. But if text flow matters to you, maybe you have a lot of dialogue content, then going for double context can be very useful. Okay, and here you can have a look at how MemoQ displays uh, the string IDs and even the text flow within a TM entry. Okay, you can see both segments here and the context ID. And down here you have the preview of an Excel file within MemoQ. Okay, good. You can also see the ID down here and the comments. Good. Source updates. Again, we talked about how files get updated very, very frequently nowadays. So there's this feature in MemoQ called X Translate, which will basically take your existing translations, even the string IDs or string keys, and reuse that uh, for your uh, file update. Okay, that way you make sure that only the perfect translations are reused and not you you have no risk of reusing the wrong translation in the wrong context okay so this is a feature that you will be using a lot if you are updating your files very frequently and of course this can be automated using templates um also if you include string ids this will improve tm leverage again the example of the term attack Sorry about that, but this is so, so clear, okay? Uh, you can see that the same term is twice in my, in my same, pro in just one single project. We have attack once, attack twice, but the translations are different in Spanish, okay? That's because one is a verb, the other one is a noun. So, based on the string ID, you will get the pre-translation of the correct one and not the, the wrong one, okay? And finally, if you're consistent with your tags and your placeholders, you will be using the regex tagger much more effectively. So regex tagger is a feature that MemoQ has that basically protects your tags and placeholders from just mistakes, okay? Uh, so if you don't use this and you import your translatable content into MemoQ, that will include tags and placeholders, and there's a risk of having the translator or reviewer change them by mistake, okay? Because we're humans, we make mistakes. Um, if you use the tagger, you will protect them. You will turn them into tokens that cannot be uh, edited. They can be deleted, of course, but then MemoQ's quality assurance module will tell you, hey, be careful, you just deleted um, a placeholder or a tag and you need to include it, okay? So it's very useful. And if you follow a clear pattern, a clear structure, you can write some very simple regular expressions like I did here. I'm not a regex expert at all. 
but with some very basic regex knowledge, knowledge you can uh, come up with some uh, simple rules to help you. And of course, if you're a MemoQ TMS user, you can also ask support for help. They've created some regex rules for me in the past, so uh, you should definitely make the most of our support. Terminology. So, terminology, me, terminology management, sorry, in MemoQ is actually very easy. Uh, I'm saying this out of experience again, using other tools in which this is not that straightforward, but in MemoQ, you just create a glossary in a couple of clicks, you click on edit and you're suddenly uh, editing it in a minute, sorry. Um, as you can see, of course, you will need to add a source term, a target term, but you can also have synonyms within the same entry, okay? Um, you can add a lot of reference information in your terms, like images, okay? Not everyone does this, but again, believe me, it's very useful. Um, it's good, for, in for instance, to add images of characters, images of items, everything helps, okay? Believe me, sometimes just by having the name of a character, we don't even know the gender, okay? Or the age or how they look like. So try to use this. Um, I know it will take some time, but it will reduce the number of questions that you'll get later, okay? You can add more information, like for instance, you can tell whether a term should be forbidden. If you know that you don't want to use that specific term, you just set it as forbidden and it will come up in black, as you can see here on the right, if your linguists are using MemoQ or you're using MemoQ TMS, okay? Um, so whenever you add a term, it will come up in blue and linguists will be able to use that in their translations. Um, we talked about creating glossaries before starting with the main project itself. And that's when the term extraction feature could be handy, okay? This is just a way of extracting terms statistically, okay? No AI involved here, so it can be a little bit hit or miss. But once you get the right settings, by tweaking it a little bit, it can be very useful. And I know that some clients of MemoQ use this uh, quite a lot. When you add terminology to MemoQ, you can play around with matching options and symbols, but of course you need to know their target language. This is usually a way of avoiding false positives in QA, okay? Um, I have a whole webinar about this, but it's in Spanish actually, but I'm sure that you can find information on how to use this um, in your own language or at least in English. Because if you take the time to add the terms correctly following the good practices that I mentioned earlier and using the right symbols and matching options, then you can use a glossary for QA, okay? As you can see down here, uh, I got some QA warnings because I was using a forbidden term and of course not using the right term. But believe me, if you are a developer thinking of using this tool and you're not going to pay attention to how you add terms to glossary, then, the tool will have a lot of false positives and the linguists will just ignore everything and real warnings and real errors will be included in those ignored items. So that means that the error will actually go live. Uh, I know this is not great, but again, from experience, I know that's the way sometimes people do it because it takes a really, really long time to go through an endless list of false positives, okay? Um, so take some time to, to build a good glossary. Um, finally, MemoQ offers some really good and flexible importing and exporting options for terminology. Um, it's very typical to have a glossary created in Excel or in Google Sheets. So you can take that and import it into MemoQ with just a couple of clicks and you can do it uh, the other way around as well, okay? If you have a term base that you like and you need to share it with, let's say, the marketing department of your company, you can export an Excel sheet and you can send them that and they will have all the up-to-date terminology uh, based on the linguist's input. Of course, we offer some other tools for collaboration. If you're working uh, in a big company, we have a module called QTerm 
uh, which is basically for that, but that's a little bit more advanced. So if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to me. And finally, let's talk about communication a little bit. Um, I know that not many people use this, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of options that MemoQ offers. So let's start with the communication tab, okay? This is a chat feature that's only available in the desktop client because MemoQ also offers a web application. And as you can see there, it's just a regular chat. Uh, people who are online can talk. You can enable or disable this as a project manager, uh, but please try to enable it and have your linguists uh, have discussions. Speaking of discussions, there's actually a feature called discussions within MemoQ, which is basically like having a forum embedded in the project, okay? Um, again, I don't see a lot of people use this, but it can be quite useful. Although I have to be honest, it's lacking some useful features, but it could, ge it could be a good starting point, at least to uh, encourage conversations and debate, basically. Uh, you have this available both in the desktop client and in the web application, okay? And finally, I'm sure that linguists that use MemoQ know this feature, but we have notes and comments within MemoQ. So you can see a screenshot of the desktop client here. Whenever you have a note or a comment uh, on a specific word, you will see that the word is highlighted. Different colors mean different things. Um, and you will also see the little bubble icon in yellow, okay? So you can double click on it or just hover uh, and you will see the note and the comment. So many people use this to encourage communication between uh, translators and reviewers, okay? So it's very, very useful. This is how it looks like when you open the comment or the note in the desktop client. Um, this is what it looks like in the web. And you can also import comments from your original files. Yeah, no matter in, in which format they are, you can have the comments imported in MemoQ so that linguists can have that context information, which I hope is clear by now. It's super, super valuable. Good. As I was saying, these were just essential and basic good practices that are way, way more. So if you want more, you can have a look at um, IGDA's Logsix Best Practices Guide for Game Localization. I always recommend that both to linguists and to game developers um, because it's really, really good. I mean, it's made up by uh, experts in the industry, so the practices are actually really good. And I try to reread it every once in a while um, just to keep things fresh, okay? Uh, but of course, we can talk about more best practices in future webinars as well. So, thank you for your attention. I hope this was clear. I hope you learned a thing or two. And if you didn't, well, at least I hope you didn't get that bored. Um, there you have my email address. Please reach out to me if you have any questions after the webinar or maybe you were watching the recording and you didn't manage to ask any questions live. And yeah. That's basically it. I don't know, girls, if there are any questions in the chat. Hello, and thank you so much, Santiago, for this amazing and wonderful webinar. Um, even I learned a lot. Like, <laughs> this was so informative and really, <laughs> really, really great. Yes, You're not saying that just so to make me feel. Okay, right? I'm not saying that just to make you feel great, uh, but no, I'm a big fan. Uh, I can't wait for more webinars of you. That's the truth, honestly. The chat was also very, very uh, excited about <laughs> all the different I'm uh, happy to hear that. information that you shared for developers and also linguists. And um, we did have um, a question that I wanted to bring up now. I know we don't have a lot of time to touch upon some. Uh, but I also want to uh, quickly say that you offered that if there's more questions, you could maybe even pick them up in writing later. Is that yeah, still of course. the same? Awesome. Okay. So uh, we had Andrew uh, Vestal bring up something that was very interesting to me, too. Oh, hey, um, Andrew. Because... Okay, you know each other already. That's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think it was uh, interesting uh, to Andrew that... Um, 
you brought up uh, the query management. And um, he says, I couldn't help but notice he took it to a spreadsheet. And we do the same, but we use a smart sheet. And I'm sure other people use Google Sheets. And um, he says the reasoning being that like they need 22 columns to track the status of all the queries and if it's been answered or not, et cetera, et cetera. And their problem is here that Smartsheet, um, it's a great repository, I'm really sorry, <laughs> of answer questions, uh, but it doesn't link back uh, to the string keys in MammoQ directly. And um, they would love to use an external spreadsheet that can be kind of like, um, you know, via API basically imported into MemoQ. And the question was now like, is there something that MemoQ supports like around, I don't know, the query sheet or like the, the external smart sheet or whatever sheet you have and like basically importing it directly? Is there anything you can think of right now? Yeah, no, unfortunately, I don't think there is anything in MemoQ that comes out of the box that can easily connect. Mm. Um, that would be amazing. I would love that, honestly. And I think that yes. the whole gaming industry would benefit from that. Yeah. What I've seen some people do is leverage the preview, actually. So they work with XML files. They include links within the XML as comments. Mm -hmm. So that makes the preview interactive in a way. You can click on the links that will take you to the query sheet and then the linguists will be able to uh, check whether there are any questions asked about that specific string. But again, it's not completely interactive. So you won't get a notification if there's any question asked about that specific row, but at least okay. you can easily check whether there's something there. So that's just an idea that maybe sparks um, development efforts for Andrew, uh, but Andrew, let's keep in touch and maybe we can come up with something together. Uh, MemoQ has this business services unit, uh, which actually takes care of custom developments for clients. Uh, of course, it's a paid service, but they've come up with great ideas. So I'll try to talk to Philip about that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks for <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks I for asking. Answered it. Yeah. yeah, it's really uh, important. I mean, we would all love a function like that. And uh, it sounded like a really interesting uh, question that I actually never thought about something like that. So very happy about uh, bringing mm -hmm. this up. Um, there was also the question about, uh, because we saw the mysterious or mystical uh, reference images that uh, definitely are a function in MemoQ, but rarely ever used, uh, sadly. Um, there was also the question now, um, is there a way to basically import images into MemoQ via API? Uh, do you know about a function like that? Yeah, th that's something that I've been personally trying to, to get into MemoQ with the business services unit. I know that some clients have had some custom developments made so that they can import images and actually preview them in MemoQ's preview at the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not something that can be easily done out of the box. So this was a specific development for the specific file type that these people were working with. Um, so there's no easy way of doing it at the moment, honestly. Uh, the closest thing you can get is using live docs. You can add mm -hmm. reference images there, but you won't be notified in the translation grid whenever there's an image for the string that you're translating. Okay, yeah, okay. I, I, it's, it's a topic of discussion at the moment. I know that for a fact, mm -hmm. but I don't really know if it will ever actually uh, Come, can come into reality, you know, in MemoQ. Hopefully, yes. I understand. Okay. Yeah, we hope so. That would also be great. I mean, yeah, we know that pictures are so important <laughs> to even understand what this thing is about. Uh, text is not always sufficient, sadly. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you so much for also touching upon that. Um, I think I have to because, you know, Mark is in the chat now and, um, it's a question that comes up a lot of times that we didn't really touch upon in the webinar, but <laughs> he worded it really like nicely. He says, how do I optimize MemoQ if I have sensitive eyes? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark, for asking that question. 
for like the fourth time <laughs> to me. Uh, that, that will become a recurring joke, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, you can go, you can get better glasses. Uh, that's a good suggestion too no no uh, honestly speaking (laughs) he's asking about dark mode uh dark mode in the desktop client i don't think that will be happening anytime soon at least (laughs) in in our idea portal it says that it's not happening i don't know maybe that will change in the future uh there are alternatives that are not great i have to admit Uh, there is this option in windows that allows you to swap you know, colors, so the background, instead of being white, will become dark. Uh, that's not a solution. I know, it's just a workaround. Uh, but if you really, really need it, I guess that's the only way to go. What I can say is that MemoQ Web will have a dark mode eventually, when it gets revamped. Uh, Ooh, they're working on that. Um, that? <laughs> it's much easier, you know, it's web. There's actually add-ons in Chrome right now that you can click on and it will turn any website dark. That's true. Uh, yeah. So I know it's not great because many people still use and prefer the desktop client, but at least for some linguists that do work online, uh, that will be a, a possibility, hopefully soon. But <laughs> for the time being, I'm sorry about that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Santiago, for touching upon mm. that too. Uh, we're very excited to hear at least the web version is going to have a dark mode, I guess. <laughs> That's so, something. Baby steps. I, w- I would love to have dark mode as well. I know, right? But <laughs> I'm just a solution engineer here, not not lead of production. But I, I try to bring all of these topics to production, so hopefully they'll listen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Santiago. <laughs> and the chat is appreciating you, <laughs> as are we. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, another thing, I'm actually not sure if I forgot a question. There weren't really a lot this time around, which is uh, a bit surprising. But uh, it's so great that you're here for any upcoming questions, like at a later point in time, and also for the people uh, watching the VOD. And um, I think I had one question that was about the um, uh, the import of Excel sheets, if that's OK. I'm <laughs> just going to bring that up now. Um, uh-huh. You showed that also you can uh, import different uh, sheets in an Excel sheet, right? And you mentioned how important consistency is, but I uh, never managed uh, with a, the delimiter and multilingual uh, filter to import different sheets. Is that a thing that's only limited for the bare uh, Excel file import, or did I miss something? Sorry, I, I didn't really understand the question. What, what do you mean okay. you didn't manage to do it? I can't manage to import uh, multiple sheets. Uh, if I have uh-huh. multiple Excel sheets, if I use the filter for multilingual. Uh-huh. No, I, I mean, if you have one single Excel yeah. sheet with different tabs, you should yeah. be able to, to import it. Um, Only the first sheet is showing up for me every single time, so I might just do something wrong. I'm not sure. There, there must, there, there must be some user error here because okay. I've tested it myself and it worked. But mm. you can write to me right. later with a sample file, and I'll personally help <laughs> you, you. Uh, build a build a filter for that. <laughs> That's very lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm pleasure. just looking through the chat right now. Um, Oh, interesting. There we have another question. Um, sorry if it's already been mentioned. They're working at the moment, like we all are chronically overworked here. Um, I was wondering if there was a way to make it so the translation does not replace the source text, but gets placed in another column. I mean, you can just choose the column, right? Yeah, that that's uh, something that you set up when you create the filter yeah. for the for the file. Again, depending on the file you're working on, I suppose that's an Excel sheet. Uh, you need to use the multilingual delimited text filter. That's usually uh, the, the filter that you need to use, mm-hmm. not the Excel file. I mean, the, the Excel, the, the default Excel filter can be used for something like, um, how do you call this? Uh, you know, financial spreadsheets, 
in which you need to translate everything. You don't need to keep the source. If you need to keep the source, just go for the multilingual delimited text filter. If you Google that, you will find MemoQ documentation on how to set it up. It's actually very simple and you will be keeping the source and the different target languages if you have several in one single file. That's, that's actually the, the way to go. Yeah, and you can also set one column to be the translation. And if you have an existing one, it just imports that as well. Exactly, yeah, it's, okay. it's quite flexible. You can have several source columns and several targets. You can import things based on colors. You can segment each cell. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty powerful. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah, for touching upon that too. Um, I guess if the chat um, has no other questions, uh, we can go right to the most important one. Is there coming, like, is there a memo cue song coming played by you with the beautiful guitar in the background? <laughs> I don't know. We We're need to ask the audience the if they would like to, to hear that or not. You know, I, yeah. I need some encouragement otherwise. <laughs> Okay, did you hear that chat? I mean, we have encouragement here. We're very excited. People brought up it's going to be the Zen mode song, <laughs> which is incredibly funny. <laughs> um, okay. One one more comment. I see yes. people, I have a look at the chat on my phone. I see some really good suggestions. Um, MemoQ has this idea portal, mm -hmm. which you can access if you have a valid SMA. Okay. Uh, it's basically a forum where you can leave your ideas, you can upvote for existing ideas. Not every idea there will become a feature, for sure. I can already say that. But I also know that production reads every single idea. And of okay. course, more specifically, those that have the most votes. So um, try to gather ideas, leave them there. I know that there's a group of translators already doing that in one of the servers. So it's actually the best way, you know, of promoting ideas. Of course, you can also tell me, but I will probably tell you, hey, go to Idea Portal, leave it there, and I will upvote myself and then probably <laughs> ping the project owners at MemoQ. But it needs to be there, okay, for them to become a reality. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you so much for telling us that. Uh, I also didn't know that you were, in fact, tediously reading all ideas and it's good to know that <laughs> there's yep. always somebody listening if you have complaints or requests so yeah that's yeah awesome. exactly i mean i know there's a lot of room for improvement but i can also say that memoq is a pretty open uh company we we listen uh not me i'm just a gaming solution engineer but I can say that the executives even listen to, to what people say, and they are constantly trying to improve the product and make it good uh, for, for everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, Santi. Yeah, I guess that's it from us. Uh, thank you so much, Chad, for being uh, so engaging and uh, amazing listeners. Uh, yeah. Thank great you. Great to have you on, Santi. And yeah, we can't wait to listen to you again for hopefully our next webinar and thank you so yeah, much let's today. keep in touch thank you for inviting us thank you everyone for being so active in the chat yes. and for listening to me thank and you. see you soon see you soon it's been a joy to have you here thank you so much thank you likewise bye-bye thank you bye -bye. thank you bye, -bye. Thank you. bye. bye everyone